I'm going to turn things over to Steve Shackley, uh, and he's going to discuss what obsidian steadies have wrought in the Southwest. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Uh, actually, the, the answer to that question uh, is in the minds of some of the people who are out here in the audience who I've, who's, uh, I've worked for, or my lab has processed samples for, for about 30 years. So I'll just call on them <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to do this. No, I wouldn't do that. Uh, I have a handout. Of course, like most of us in academia, we're used now to, we're used to uh, PowerPoint and lots of images to hide behind. I can't do that tonight, but I did bring this. So uh, this is like the old days. Uh, those of us that are old enough to remember that. Uh, handouts, yeah. yeah, or overhead projector, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's right. OK. Uh, so let's start with the, the front side. Uh, so I guess I've alluded to the point that I've been doing this for 30 years for good or for bad. And um, my undergraduate degrees are, are both in geology and archaeology. But what happened, and it happened to a lot of people, I got turned on to archaeology right away. And so geology kind of stayed in the background until I got to uh, graduate school in the early 80s at ASU. And uh, we did a project called the Picacho Reservoir Archaic Project uh, by Picacho Reservoir. And there was quite a bit of obsidian in these archaic sites. And uh, the field director, Frank Bam, said, hey, you're from California. You know all about sourcing obsidian. So why don't you source the obsidian? And I said, well, OK, well, that sounds like a, an interesting job. So uh, the map on the left, when I started looking into it, were the known sources at that time around in the early 1980s. So of course, if you're trying to determine the source of a, an obsidian artifact, you have to have that data from the source itself. So that's how it all started. So I, you can blame or thank Frank Bam for that, uh, getting this started. So the other, on the map on the other side, of course, is what it looks like in 2011. So much so that, um, with some exceptions, almost all the work we do, and I'll talk about how we do that work, north of the border in Arizona or New Mexico, there's virtually no unknown sources in the sites. Now, when you get down close to the border, uh, look at northern Sonora, for instance. It looks like there's a big blank there. Well, it's not because there aren't sources there. It's because we haven't found them. And of course, right now, the border areas. <laughs> My wife has some objection to me continuing to work in northern Mexico, but uh, we're still working on ways to deal with that. For one thing, working with uh, geologists in Ina, uh, uh, in Ege. To, uh, to do that. So we're still continuing that. So it doesn't mean that the sources aren't there. It's just that we haven't found them yet. Chihuahua is a little bit different story, because I started working there about uh, 10, 15 years ago. And we have a much better idea. And yes, the sources uh, in northern Mexico find their way up uh, uh, north of the border, because the border, of course, didn't exist prehistorically. So that's part of that story. Um, so I had to become a geologist again, which was fine. The reason I went into geology originally in the 70s is that I was going to be a rich petroleum geologist. Uh, and then you know what happened with the Saudis and those of you that are, remembered the long gas lines and all that. So petroleum geology disappeared. So it was archaeology, and here we are. Um, what hath obsidian studies wrought in southwestern archaeology? When I first started doing this, uh, I mean, there are a few people who might take exception to this, but the vast majority of inferences about prehistory in the Southwest were derived from ceramic analysis. Nobody really cared about the first 10,000 years of prehistory, where there was no pottery. And in fact, it, it was a, a somewhat of a struggle. So in a way, I had to prove that obsidian source provenance would provide the kind of information that archaeologists need to, to deal with subjects like exchange, group interaction, social identity, all those things that we're interested in in both 20th century archaeology and now certainly 21st century archaeology. But slowly it, it happened. And in fact, one of the first ones to really come on board was Bill Doley at Desert Archaeology and now the Center for Desert Archaeology. And we've been doing thousands of samples since that time. And I'm not going to go into detail about that, but the project we're doing on, on social networking in the late classic in the Southwest is very much changing our ideas of how people are moving around the landscape in the Southwest at that time period, where they lived, and who they were. 
and we're doing it in concert with ceramic analysis. So it's a big change in the way we look at uh, prehistory just by looking at this other data set. So I think you have an idea of what we have to do. Of course, the most important first thing, as I mentioned, is to find the sources. And that's been a 30-year project, and you can see that on that first page. Um, there's a couple very new ones. Uh, you'll see Los Sitios del Agua, uh, just below the border in Sonora, uh, near Los Vidrios. And uh, Rick Martinek found that. Uh, I don't think he's here tonight. At uh, the Arizona Archaeological Society group that works down in northern Sonora, or at least they used to. I'm not sure they still do. Uh, that was a source that was called Arizona Unknown A for a decade that we were finding in sites north of the border. And I thought, well, maybe it's in Arizona. We just don't know. Now that we know that it's uh, south of the border, then we can derive some ideas, some inferences about uh, how that stuff was moving. Now we know that it's moving uh, up north uh, from the Gulf. And what else are they getting from the Gulf? They're getting shells. I mean, yeah, that's right. They're getting shells from the Gulf. So they're bringing that material up at the same time. Actually, it's a better, and something else I'll mention too, not only understanding the geology of the sources and where they are, but understanding the technological attributes of the obsidian is just as important. And this is a good example. Los Vidrios obsidian covers a very large area, a much larger area than Los Sitios del Agua. But the quality of Los Sitios del Agua, and I'm a flint napper and I nap all of this stuff, is much better. And actually we find more of the Los Sitios del Agua than Los Vidrios in sites, even though there's more of it there. Um, let's see. Time for a drink of Guinness. <laughs> so understanding the location of the source is very important. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, it's perfectly logical. Um, Question, can you identify the obsidian from a particular source? Yeah, I will. I'll get to that in a minute, how we do that. Uh, that's, that's on the second page. I don't want to get that. <laughs> You'll remind me, though, if I... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there's another one that you see it says Nut Mountain. And right north of that, there's a source called Gwyn Canyon. Well, uh, that source is dated by Argon Argon to about 22 million years ago. Well, when I f first found this uh, in these little tiny Marekinites, as you know, probably as Apache Tears, and uh, down in Sierra County in New Mexico, I analyzed them, and the chemistry was identical to Gwyn Canyon. And I go, oh my God, how did that happen? Well, what's happened is over 22 million years, that source has eroded to the south in drainages that no longer exist. So geologists are very much interested in this right now because they get a pretty good idea what was going on in the landscape in the last 22 million years. Now, what does that mean to us? It gets worse. You, uh, <laughs> Some of you are probably familiar with Valles Caldera in northern New Mexico, in the Jemez Mountains. Almost all of those sources there, which are fairly recent, about a million to a million and a half years old, some up to two million years old, erode, erode all the way through the Rio Grande to Chihuahua. Okay, now those of you that are interested in exchange and group interaction and those kind of things can see the real problem there. So just because you find an obsidian source at a point in space, does not necessarily mean that that is the source. In this case, you have a source that's 500 kilometers long. And what I've been doing in my field schools, my petrology field schools over the years, is mapping uh, all the way along the Rio Grande to Chihuahua what, what sources are there, the size of the nodules, and you can probably see why you need to know that, uh, from the Amos Mountains all the way down south of Socorro. Because if you're working on a Clovis site like Mockingbird Gap that's south of, of Socorro, and you have, we have Clovis points that are this big, and they go, well, how come they're so small? And that's because they're getting obsidian from the Rio Grande. And we do have obsidian points that big. And in fact, those of you that are familiar with the Murray, Murray Springs Clovis site, there's three Clovis points made from obsidian there, and not, all of them are smaller than 50 millimeters because they're made from another source in eastern Arizona called Cow Canyon. 
And they were using them at Murray Springs. And in fact, I have a paper coming out soon where it seems that Cal Canyon was a desired material for producing small Clovis points. So they're actually focusing on this source to make small Clovis points. Now, what's got up, up many of my Paleo-Indian friends and colleagues upset is that I've suggested that there was a bimodal distribution of point sizes, because I'm sure everybody's seen Clovis points that are like this. That maybe the large ones are for thrusting spears and the small ones are for atlas, for darts. Oh boy, they get really upset when they hear that. So that's, that is a possibility. It's one that, and I don't really care. And it can be either way for me. You know, it's fine with me, I don't really care. So understanding the distribution of the source, not only the primary source, but its secondary distribution is very important. Now, a big Center for Desert Archaeology project right now is up in Mule Creek, and uh, you can see Mule Creek here, in western New Mexico. And those sources have been eroding for about 17 million years into the San Francisco River and the Gila River all the way to Geronimo, Arizona, at least that far. So even if we find Mule Creek obsidian here in Tucson, which we have, along the San Simon, which we have, and in the Phoenix Basin, they could have got some of it from much closer than Mule Creek. Now, I have a, a real apocryphal story about that, and then I'll go on to your question. Uh, at the Pecos Conference in 1995, which was in the Membrays Valley, there was an archaeologist who remained nameless, who just finished his master's degree out of uh, San Antonio, I think it was San Antonio or Austin, and he dug up a, a site called Goat Hill Pueblo, which is down in the San Simone Valley. And he derived this, he's, he made the mistake of sending the obsidian to another lab. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, he derived this, San Simone Valley is down near Safford, and he derived this exchange model with the membranes up at Mule Creek because almost all of his obsidian was from Mule Creek. So after he gave his paper, and later on we were sitting around drinking a beer, and I said, you know, Kyle, you know that Mule Creek obsidian is right at your site. And he got this, he turned absolutely white. And, I, and so I said, oh, but before you react to that, did, have you already defended your thesis? And he says, yes, I have. And I said, well, no problem. <laughs> so that little apocryphal, real apocryphal story uh, gives you an idea of how much work you have to do with these sources, not just the primary source. but And of course, you get to walk throughout the Southwest. And I, I can't think of anything that's better than that. All right. So on the back page, and this is a real project, this is from the project up at Mule Creek, how do we determine the composition of the subsidium and determine the source? Now this is where the geology com comes in. I did some geochemistry when I was an undergrad, and I run a lab called the Geoarchaeological XRF Laboratory at Berkeley, uh, which, is now, which is moving to Albuquerque this summer. And, uh, the great thing about X-ray fluorescent spectrometry, and I can tell you how it works, although it would make physicists scream if I simplified it this way, but essentially what you do is you bombard a substance with very high energy X-rays, 50,000 volts, for instance. And what it does is it causes the electrons to move from one orbit to the other. And as they move back into the orbit, or it can come from another uh, atom, actually, <laughs> it generates uh, what's called fluorescent X-rays. And we measure that. And what that measurement of the, the wavelength and the intensity essentially, and this is a simplification, tells you what atoms are in that substance. That's essentially what it does. And what's great about it for archaeology is that it's very sensitive. In, in fact, the new instrumentation that we have is extremely precise and accurate. Uh, it's non-destructive. And the instrument that, we, that I have at Berkeley and in my house has a chamber about this big or this tall, so you can put some pretty big objects in there, and we have done that before. We, also, we do metals and environmental stuff and, and all that, measure, measuring the amount of lead and all of the plates and everything that we <laughs> use all the time. So, uh, so that's essentially ha how we do it. You have a question? So are you identifying trace elements Correct. in the yeah, the same thing. The advantage, however, with obsidian, obsidian is one of the few, maybe the only real disordered substances in the universe. Glass. It's a glass. It doesn't have a crystalline structure. So that means 
There's exceptions to that. It means that any point that you measure on that, the chemistry is going to be the same. Ceramics are not that way. You have to be very careful with that. So uh, there's a lot of exceptions to that. But for us tonight, let's just make that assumption. And that's generally true. There's a lot of variability in a single source, for instance. And Mule Creek is a good example. There's at least three, and I think there's probably four chemical groups there. We're in the midst of an isotopic and argon-argon dating project at Mule Creek and get a better idea how they relate to each other. But you can see there on the plots how these separate. Now, the, the one down below shows um, the sources. There's the three, ma three major sources there. Mule Mountains, up at the top is Antelope Creek, and the center is called Gwyn U Canyon. This is up in the Mugion Mountains. And the chemistry is very similar. If you don't have, now this is a good example. If you didn't have the data, this, the source data from Gwyn Canyon, you might assume that you have a, a continuous distribution in here. In other words, all of these sources might be the same or look the same. So you really have to have that source data. Otherwise, you couldn't discriminate or determine that Gwyn Canyon was right in between those two. Uh, on the one below is uh, the element yttrium and niobium, parts per million, rubidium and zirconium on the upper left, and yttrium and niobium. This is actually from the project that we just finished, a very large project. It was Rob Jones' dissertation. He's probably not going to finish now because <laughs> I've complicated his life. <laughs> Well, just, you just think you'll keep working at, at CDA forever. So, you know. <laughs> um, and, and in short, that's how it works. And the instrument, kind of an aside here, the instrument, instrumentation is great because calibration takes a long time with these instruments. But once you're done, the software now, just like everything else in our life, is so simple that undergraduates do a lot of this work. It's very simple for them. And they get projects out of it, too. Um, I made the mistake about 15 years ago. I, had a, I teach this every XRF every semester. And I, I made the mistake of saying, I could teach a monkey to do this. <laughs> so when they finished the class, they, they got t-shirts that said Shackley's Monkey Lab. <laughs> I got in trouble a lot over the years saying those kinds of things. So does that make sense to you? I could, believe me, I could talk all night about this. But in general, that's the way it works. Uh, What's interesting about the Mule Creek project, actually, is that there were three, three, sites at Mule, three sites at Mule Creek, right, that we looked at. And the procurement was different in those sites, even though they're, what, a radius of two or three miles from each other, something like that? Yeah. And they're contemporaneous. So now Rob has to explain that. But uh, it's interesting. If you're looking at the same people, what are they doing? Uh, also. Um, the, the technological issue, and I think Rob's experienced the same thing, there's three major sources there called North Sawmill Creek, Mule Mountains, and Antelope Creek. And Antelope Creek is the most commonly used, and I find it as a napper to be the worst of the three. However, it's volumetrically the most common, and I think that's what's, what's really going on. And in fact, at one of, most of these sites, you just walk out into the wash, and there, there it is. And I think that's what, what's going on. I mean, it's kind of an uninteresting explanation. But I think that's really what's happening. I find Mule Mountains to be the best. But Mule Mountains is quite a bit farther east. So you have to actually walk to it. So why do that if you've got some right here? I mean, it's kind of simplistic, but people are like that. I always remind students that, particularly hunter-gatherers, and even these people at Mule Creek, everything that they own, they had to carry on their back. I've got a Toyota Tacoma. I can fill this thing with 1,000 kilos of obsidian if I want to and, and haul it into my yard, which I do do. But, they couldn't do that prehistorically. So energetics is a big part of this thing. Again, that goes back to why it's very important to understand the secondary distribution of these sources, too. Because a flint napper does not care where he or she gets raw material. You know, if it's right there, oh, right. You know, they're not going, I'm going to really screw with this archaeologist a thousand years from now. They don't really think that way. You know, it's just wherever it happens to be. They got to ditch up the backyard. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, we had a backyard down in La Paz in Baja, California that had a bunch of obsidian. So that's another story. Though. So. What are the primary concerns 
Well, it's, yeah, the primary constituents are silicon aluminum oxides. That would be about 80, 80 to 90 percent. The iron. Iron is about 1 to 3 percent. Some, but what's interesting, though, uh, rock hounds love all these different types. You get a little bit more manganese and you get more purple out of it. Uh, a little bit more iron, you start getting green. Lositio stelagua is what's called a peralkaline vol vol volcanic rock because the iron is relatively high and the obsidian is green. It's beautiful. It's like there's a, a famous one in Mexico called Pachuca. And uh, Los Sitio del Agua looks like Pachuca. Here's another apocryphal story. When De Peso was working at Takime, it was long before there was any work like this. They looked at it and they go, okay, well, this is from this source and this is from that source. A lot of the stuff was green. So he goes, oh, this is great. This is from Takime down in Hidalgo. No, it's all local. Because of most of the obsidian in uh, Sierra Madre is peralkaline and very green. So you can't do it by looking at it. No. Steve, could you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. Um, he was asking about if the uh, nappability, this is an archaeology term, <laughs> how well a raw material flakes uh, is related to the chemical composition. In a general sense, yes. Because if water, uh, in the original melt, if the water exceeds about 1%, it uh, creates another substance called vitrophere, or even become perlite. And everybody knows what perlite is. If you have used potting soil, you see the little white dots in there, and that's perlite. And of course, in Arizona, your roads bases are you know, perlite, or at least they used to be years ago. So in a general sense, yes, uh, that's water, that's H2O. But as far as the traces are concerned, no. I haven't seen any relationship. However, Mule Creek comes to mind. The, the compositional difference between these three sources is pretty minor. It's not, not very different, but boy, that Antelope Creek stuff is, I just don't use it. I don't like it. I've got a lot of other neat stuff, you know, big nozzle sizes. So what is it? I don't know. I, I don't know the answer to that. Well, once you take water out of the equation, I don't know what it is. Uh, it's, uh, but the vast majority of these, that's another point, these Marekanite sources, and I'm going to pass some of this stuff around in a minute, um, are were most likely the most vitreous parts of the original flow. So they are the glassiest parts, and the reason they are, and the reason you find them is because they're the parts that have not absorbed water. Now, some of you have heard about obsidian hydration dating, and that's essentially what it is. Silicon aluminum oxides very rapidly absorb water or they bond with water. And when that happens, it breaks that bond between silicon and aluminum. And when it does that, you, don't, you have a crystalline substance. You no longer have a nappable material. But we think, geologists don't care about obsidian the way we do. They, they really look at it very much. Michael Manga at Berkeley is the only person who looks at it. They, they were probably the most vitreous, glassy, driest part of the flow. So we have obsidian that's 20 million years old. The rest of the stuff is all perlite. A good example is 17.7 million year old Antelope Creek. If you go out there to the primary source, you see thousands of hectares of perlite. These perlite rhyolite dome rims. It's really beautiful. And it's on public land. Anybody can go out there. And then millions of these little black rocks. Little black rocks in the desert. It's really interesting. Okay, so um, now if and if it, now, because of that, it's a good segue. If obsidian is very recent and has not absorbed very much water, you get this. This is a piece from Government Mountain right up here and by Flagstaff. And uh, this stuff was used throughout prehistory. It's great for making fluted points. I love to make Clovis points out of this stuff. Uh, and this is, when I first got to Arizona in uh, 1980, you could get nodules this big. But these damn flint nappers, they've been, <laughs> you know? So I know a couple of places left. 
<laughs> or you can get this, but you've got to pack it back down. Along the road there, you're lucky to find something this big. Okay, so there you go, you can pass that around. That's, that's good glass, it's good stuff. Lots of Clovis points up on the Colorado Plateau made out of Government Mountain. However, the vast majority of sources in the Basin Range are tertiary. They're 10, 15, 20 million years old. So most of that stuff is devitrified, and what you have left are these little guys, which you've probably all seen. So I have some examples from all over the Southwest. I have uh, Los Sitios del Agua, the one we just found in Northern Sonora. North Sawmill Creek, which is a Mule Creek. Uh, Mule Mountains, which is the one I like, in Mule Creek. And then the, we've been talking about Antelope Creek. I'll pass some this way. And pass some this way. You can't eat these. They, they won't. Some people have accused me of eating obsidian, but I don't. Yeah, you have to look at it in a small flake, though. It's not like Pachuca. Pachuca is, boy, that's really green. Yeah. yeah. But when you flake it, it has a nice gray-green cast. It's really beautiful. There was one portion there where the glass was green, but a very light green. But the, the pieces were very small. Now, I, I discovered uh, Los Vitrios. Well, actually, Julian Hayden told me where it was, uh, about 1983. And uh, Todd Boswick and I went down to the end of Rio Sanoita and followed it back up for all those reasons that I've been talking about. We found Los Vidrios and we collected samples and recorded it and mapped it and the whole thing. And we missed this source. We were within a half a kilometer of Los Sitios del Agua. We missed it. So, you know, even geologists make mistakes. So, but it's a very small source. It's very tiny, you know, compared to Los, Vid uh, Los Vidrios, which is acres and acres, hectares and hectares and hectares of, of obsidian. It's a, a beautiful area to go down to. Probably now is not the time to be there, but because it's also a, uh, the cartel is using the Rio Sanoita right now too, so that's the kind of place you want to use. Anything else? You're going to let me off easy? You seem to be. Okay, it, um, just real quick, if you don't feel like asking a question out loud, there's pencils and pad, pad, pens and pads of paper. You can write oh, questions down, idea. and I'll collect Looks them like as, you have one. as we go. Okay, all right, I take them out. All right, good. Personal I even brought notes. my glasses, so I'll be able to read them. Me too. Sherry, could you wait one second, please? There's one site that had obs um, rainbow obsidian. Where mm -hmm. is that? You mean the source itself? Uh huh. Well, the one I know of is in Warner Mountains in far northeastern California mm -hmm. by Goose Lake. That's the one I know about. Uh, that's is that that's not what you're thinking. Of? Uh, I thought maybe it was down in Mexico. Yeah, well, there probably is. Yeah, there very well could be something. Because there was a lot of stuff um, in the Phoenix Basin, I think, that had that um, very rainbow quality to it when I was doing analysis. Yeah. Did I did I analyze that? Uh huh. Well, where did I say it was from? <laughs> I don't remember. That's why I'm asking you. I thought you're you're younger than me. You're supposed to remember that. Well, it, well, uh, well. I analyze what about ten thousand samples a year, maybe more, because of Center for Desert Archaeology. So, uh, so even even though I'm not very much younger than you, <laughs> I uh, and I don't remember. But I don't uh, the. The Mexican sources would be uh, that we see very much in southern Arizona and well, a little bit in southern New Mexico is Sierra Fresnal and Chihuahua, but that's not rainbow. Uh, what do you mean by rainbow? Was it banded? Is banded? So when you look at you pull it up to the light and it looks banded. Anywhere there was a cut or a hit would have a rainbow. Oh, okay. Well, that, that's, that's a character of glass itself. You can get that with a window glass sometimes. You break it. You know, I, I live in Berkeley, and you know, they, a lot of people go by, well, it's Arizona. You know, go by with guns, and they shoot windows out, and all this kind of thing. And those, those are actually called Hertzian cones. And, and if you find the pieces of them, you'll get a prismatic effect 
in, in that, and it looks like a rainbow. That's the only thing I can think of. Well, there was a huge piece at the Jim and Mineral Show a few years ago that was carved into a butterfly. Wow, it that sounds neat. It was definitely rainbow. Did, 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 it was from Mexico. It was from Mexico, huh? I don't, I don't think it's the sources in northern Mexico. I mean, there's a lot of obsidian sources down in New Mexico. So, uh, but there is a one that has a rainbow effect up in Warner Mountains. And I have some in my yard in Albuquerque, but I didn't bring any with me. So. Yeah, I liked it too. Yeah? Like Paleo Indian quarries? I'm wondering whether you do other materials besides obsidian, uh, Paleo Indian uh -huh. quarries. Uh, I have a paper like coming out in uh, uh, Journal of Archaeological Science pretty soon on a day site in northern New Mexico. And the late Paleo groups, particularly the Folsom, we're using this day site, which is not, you, when you looked at it, it looks like basalt. It's been called basalt for years, but it's not. It's a day site. It's more silicic like rhyolite. And they make these beautiful Folsom points out of it, uh, as well as uh, Alan Frederick and all that late stuff, late Pale Indian stuff. And uh, what's great about day site is the composition is similar to rhyolite. It's very silicic. And uh, it quenches very easily. It's not a glass, really, but it's, the crystalline structure is very tiny, so the variability is not real great. So we've been able to do the same thing with that. We've done some basalt studies, but most of the basalt studies I've done have been in the South Pacific. Uh, what's great about that is that stuff gets like 3,000 kilometers or 5,000 kilometers because you've got an island here that has the, the source, you know, and, it, and, uh, and the stuff in Hawaii actually is crap. It's not very good. Hawaiiite's not very good basalt. But some of the stuff farther south. Yeah, crap. Is, you know, <laughs> There's a lot of yeah terms that I couldn't say in public. Why have they you focused on obsidian? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is the geological reason is that it's homogeneous, and you don't have the problems you do with ceramics. You don't have this variability in it. Um, it's not completely true, but compared to crystalline material, yeah, uh, and it's all over the Southwest, and it has a. Well, let me back up from that a little bit. I mean. There, I've, wor I've worked in Mexico, too, in Central Mexico. And there you have these full-time specialists that are producing uh, blades. They're producing these blades from sources great distances. And you, you look at some of these households, and there is a pile of obsidian from one source behind this guy's house that's like this high. Um, I find that to be boring, really. You know, I'm more interested in the Southwest where it's not a major constituent of this. How, how much, what's the proportion, Rob, in these sites, do you know, of obsidian? Mule Creek's a little strange because it's all, it, there's so much available. Yeah, so much available. That's probably not a good one to use. But, but, but in general, way less than 5%. Yeah, and often less than 1%. Yeah. So it's a, it's, a, it's a rare event geologically in the Southwest, and it's a rare event as far as using it. And that has some interest to archaeologists, like why? Why are they importing this raw material that's 300 kilometers away? You know, we've seen 500 kilometers in the southwest. You know, the, the big piece of government mountain you're seeing, we find that stuff all the way down to the border, at least. Uh, so a great distance away. But then it makes sense, well, you got a big chunk. Um, this, the Vias Rhylite or Cerro de Media source from the Hamas Mountains is distributed throughout North America. My graduate student, my former graduate student, Carolyn Dillian, found one in a beach site in New Jersey. She found a, a little piece of debitage and also complete projectile points. Um, she has one from the Black Rock source in Utah in New Jersey, and the point type would fit right in with a Great Basin point type. Now, now start thinking socially how, that, how long that took to get from Utah to New Jersey. It's, uh, it wasn't some guy so, wow, I'm going to take a trip. I'm going to New Jersey. You know? I, don't, I don't think that's the way things work. You know, we, we've used this term down the line exchange for years and years in, in archaeology. And, uh, it's, it's a lot more interesting than that. Uh, there's a time period in the Midwest called Hopewell, which you might be familiar with, that really focused on obsidian. Um, sites are full of it, but when you get to the Mississippi and later, it's gone. I mean, just, it's not there at all. And when you do find it in the Mississippian sites, there's just a few pieces. It's from Mexico. It's not from Western North America. 
So something happened socially there. The relationships with the Western North America disappeared in the Mississippian period and went south. But when you look at the artifacts, you look at the objects, Mississippian objects, they really, especially the, those beautiful carved shell gorgets that are about this big, I mean, they, I mean, I hate to do this as an archaeologist, but they really look Mexican. They really do. It's really amazing. So it makes some sense. Did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, you were saying that there was local variation, trace variation yeah. in the obsidian. Have you found any sites where the trace elements seem similar, where you can't tell from one ah, site that's to a another? Good, yeah, that's a good one. The, the Nut Mountain case was one that really confused me for a while because um, you can see on that map, Nut Mountain is considerably south of Gwyn and U Canyon, where the primary source is, and, and it's 22 million years old. The drainage systems don't go down there directly now, but they did 22 million years ago. So they were draining down in that direction. So in that case, it was pretty confusing. I haven't reported this thing yet because I'm waiting for the argon-argon dates. If the argon-argon dates come out different, I'm in trouble. Uh, because we have this, what, what the, we call it imposters, and you have a, the first source you find, and then you find another one later, and the chemistry is the same. Uh, but I will tell you now that the um, strontium and neodymium isotopes are different between these two, so I'm a little worried that they are going to, so now we have to explain it if that occurs. Now, what does that do for archaeologists? So you think you have Gwen U Canyon in your site over in West Texas. But which source is it from and if we can't discriminate it? So if you really need to, to do it, you're going to have to pay a couple hundred dollars and do the isotope work. So that's a real problem. But the, but the shorter answer is very rarely. Um, and there's, there's some geochemical reasons for that. One of it has to do with the fact that it's a disordered substance, that it's completely, there's no crystalline structure to it, which means in general, the chemistry is not going to change over time. If you have crystalline structure to it, as uh, the crystal metamorphoses, for instance, it changes its chemistry, which is a real pain when you're dealing with things like chert, something like that. That's why I don't, it goes back to your, I guess your question, why I don't deal with chert too much. Um, that's one of them. The other one is when a rhyolite dome erupts and that material is quenched into a glass, it occurs in a very short period of time. So there's not enough time for what we call fractionation to occur chemically in that reaction. Um, not, a, not enough time for wall rock re reaction to occur, bring in something else into that. It happens so fast, because this stuff quenches in a few days. If you slow it down too much, you're going to get rhyolite. And if you take 10 million years, you're going to get the Sierra Nevada. It's all the same, it's all the same chemistry. The, uh, obsidian, rhyolite, and granite are all the same thing. It's just cooling rate. That's simplistic, but that's technically the, the case. So uh, we're really fortunate. It's the, that's why I use this stuff. I mean, it's, thank God I work in the, you know, the, the Pacific Rim area where there's lots of obsidian. And of course, there is that weird Yellowstone, the, the hotspot area. But yeah. Actually, we have a question over here next. OK. Um, this might be for some of the audience members rather than you, but what kind of behavioral questions are people asking and answering with this? I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, well, we found this from this source right. 2,000 miles away, but are people getting into a lot more uh, fine-grained oh, yeah. uh, questions? Yeah, about even me. You know, they've, my post-possessional colleagues have sucked me into it. Um, <laughs> Uh, I have a, a book that came out in 2005 through UVA Press called Obsidian Geology and Archaeology of North American Southwest. Chapter 7, I think, was on the pre-classic Holocom, which is a time period I'm particularly interested in. I don't care about that classic stuff. And uh, although they're sucking me in on that stuff, too. But uh, a grad student colleague of mine, Chuck Hoffman at ASU, began to look at the morphology and what he's calling style of pre-classic Holocom projectile points. Now, a lot of people have seen this. I mean, those pre-classic Holocom nappers were really good. Uh, you know, old guys like Don Crabtree replicated them. I mean, they're just beautiful. And a lot of them are found in burials, too, but not all of them. Well, Chuck came up with a typology of the Sacatone or Sacatone phase or sedentary period Holocom points. 
And to make an interesting but long story short, he found that the styles of points were different in three areas. The middle Gila area made particular style of points. Over by Gatlin, over by the Gila Bend made a, another style. And then the Phoenix Basin made a, a, a different styles of points, all contemporaneous. And, uh, but he didn't, he didn't characterize and determine the source for any of the obsidian. And I go, wow, this is really interesting. Let me back up a little bit. His uh, inference or his conclusion was that we were looking at these male groups that may have been involved, may have been ball game teams, ball court teams, may have been, uh, in, uh, may have been separated based on the canal irrigation system that they, like they do in the South, Southeast Asia and uh, organized in sodalities, which is a term we use in, in anthropology to talk about uh, a group of affinal, not necessarily blood-related people that uh, associate for a whole variety of reasons. The Kishan and Mojave, for instance, had warrior sodalities. And they painted their bodies in specific ways to show their membership with these sodalities. And I think Emil Howery knew that. If you look at the 1967, uh, I think the 67 National Geographic on uh, Snake Town, look at the ball players. And so I usually do this with PowerPoint, you can see all this. So you just imagine this. A lot of people probably here have seen that issue. Look at the ball players. Well, the two teams have different uh, body painting. That body painting is identical to two different sodalities among the Mojave that he probably got from the Krober and Krober book on Mojave warfare. So I'm beginning to think, hmm, that's really interesting. But he didn't characterize the obsidian. And boy, they made a lot. Pre-classic were using a lot of obsidian to make points. Uh, a lot of stuff, uh, you know, Las Colinas, La Ciudad, sites here in the Tucson Basin, uh, pretty amazing. So I said, okay, well, I'm going to go back to those same points, uh, a lot of them were at ASM here, and analyze the source provenance, where they were from. Well, what I found was in the, those three areas that made different projectile points, they were using completely different sources. They were, with some exceptions, they were not using sources from the other areas. And there are some exceptions to that that I'll get to in a moment. Uh, the Middle Gila, for instance, like Snake Town, we're using mostly Superior, Picket Post Mountain, which is close, it's nearby. So I said, okay, well, that makes sense. Right? So I went over to uh, the Gatlin side and over Gila Bend, and I look at those, and they were using mostly Sauceda and Vultures, mostly Sauceda and Sand Tanks over there. I go, well, this makes sense, kind of boring. I mean, they're just, you know, just using sources that are nearby. Well, then I started looking at the stuff in the Phoenix Basin. And it's completely different. Half of the material that they were getting was from the Colorado Plateau. And not only was half of the material from the Colorado Plateau, that obsidian, but the point types were not Hohokam point types. They were Kohonina points. They were very different. Or Sanagua, what are you going to call them up there at that time? Um, so, okay, so we have this data. We know that it's very different. They're making different, they're differentiating themselves by the point types. They're using different sources. They're not made together, but they're all Hohokam. And when I was an undergraduate, here's this, here's the preclassic Hohokam. It's this homogeneous thing. They're all making red and buff pottery. And if you're familiar with Dave Abbott's work, well, maybe not everybody was making red and buff pottery. Uh, so how would they, how do you explain that? Well, I go back to what Chuck Hoffman was suggesting and the Mojave and the Kechan, the way they identify themselves. Maybe that's what they were doing. Now, the points are only one part of a much larger object, aren't they? An arrow. So, and the arrow probably was, was decorated in very specific ways, showing membership in a sodality or some kind of membership. And when you look at the pre-class, there's a lot of things that are really interesting about the pre-class. One is, of course, canal irrigation, which is very extensive. But also, it's the ball courts, which practically disappear when you get to the classic. I mean, it was a big thing. When you look at that map of ball courts and and I, I'm not a ball court nut, but if you look at that, <laughs> if you look at that, the map of ball courts in Arizona, it goes all the way up to Flagstaff. It's just, there's little, very small uh, pre-classic sites with great big ball courts. So it was a big deal for them. It was like baseball for us, you know? It's a big kind of deal. And I think Doc Howery understood that, because he didn't, he was on 21st century archaeology, but he must have seen that, because when you look at those ball players, they are decorated in very different ways. Maybe one of them was, one team was from Gatlin, the other one was from Snaketown or Las Colinas or something like that. 
So they're, they are identifying themselves. They're creating an identity with what we call emblemic style, emblem, emblemic style. Now, Obsidian was able to shed a tremendous amount of light on that Obsidian source program, as well as the projector point um, technology, uh, the projector point style. They're very different. Now, I'm going to talk about pottery for a minute. If what Dave Abbott and his graduate students are saying up at ASU is that the vast majority of, of Sacatone red and pottery was produced in only two or three sites along the middle Gila and then distributed throughout, if, this is a big if, I can get in trouble for this, if the women were producing the red and buff pottery and distributing it throughout the, that area, we, we uh, in, in anthropology we call that assimilation or integration. The men were doing the opposite. They were differentiating themselves. Now, this is all one society. So even, even if it's not women and men, but it's m kind of neat if it was, and it's more interesting <laughs> if it was women and men. Because Judith Habesh Moshe suggested that, well, why couldn't the men be making the, the decorated ceramics and the women making the, the, the plainwares? Well, it doesn't make sense to me, but nevertheless, that could be. Well, maybe the women were making the, the neat points and the men were making the ugly ones. I don't know. <laughs> but, but nevertheless, there's this social differentiation that's occurring within one society. And when you look at the, the Phoenix Basin, maybe they, they weren't even exactly, they didn't identify themselves completely as Holocom because it seems that they had just as much of a relationship with the people up on the plateau as they did other Holocom. And there is a ball court, was it up in, uh, it's the farthest northern one, Wapaki, yeah. And that's where they make those points, just like the ones that, at Palo Verde Ruin in Phoenix. So source provenance, I mean, it's neat to say, yeah, it's from over there or something. We used to use this term exchange. I just hate that word now. Because more and more what we're finding, both not with just the work that I'm doing, but what we're doing with ceramics, we're finding out that the stuff is not moving. It's the people that are moving. I mean, when I was <laughs> when, I, when I was working at La Ciudad in, what, 82 or something like that, you find black and white pottery. Oh, God, look at this, was exchanged. Now we're finding, because the work, a lot of the work that they're doing at CDA and what Dave Abbott's doing with petrography as well as chemistry on the ceramics, they're finding out that they're making the black and white stuff down here out of local pottery, local clay. So what does that mean? Well, it means these people are moving this way. And what we're finding with the obsidian source provenance is that it, boy, it moves right along with that. You start finding that stuff from up there, down there. So pretty, pretty neat. So social identity is, identity is something I'm really interested in in that time period. When we look at uh, the Paleo-Indian stuff, well, I'm doing that along the Rio Grande, we found I'm interested in, in what call, is called procurement range among hunter-gatherers, not territories. Territories don't work very well when you have uh, one group every 10 million square hectares. You know, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's not a big deal. But they do tend to move in specific ranges, we found. I did that in my dissertation work a long time ago. And along the Rio Grande, we're finding that um, those south of uh, Valles Caldera and the Jemez have a specific range using both the dacite and the obsidian. And those north are using specific sources, too. And they all seem to meet right at Valles Caldera, which I thought was really interesting. And two years ago, I was working up with Anna Stefan in the Caldera, and we were talking to uh, some elders, elders meaning people my age, uh, from Cochiti, Hamas, and San Alfonso. And they all stood around and they said, oh yeah, for us, Valles Caldera was neutral ground, that you had a everybody had access to resources there, both animal and obsidian and raw material. And I think that was going on, that's been going on for 12,000 years in the Southwest, because that's based on that work. So that's another, you can start looking at procurement range that way too. So it's interesting. So there was kind of a southern late Paleo Indian group and a, a northern and the northern group uh, also has obsidian from uh, Utah, Nevada. That's long, that is a long way away. So I think a change was probably going on in those early periods, but in, in a kind of a different way. You know, you'd have like summer, you meet somebody 10 years, you know, every 10 years or something like that. Or maybe, you know, your, your uh, sister ended up meeting this guy and ended up moving to Nevada. You know, <laughs> it's a very, and, and that's, that's a pretty amazing thing when you think of walking uh, between San Luis Valley and Southern they Colorado. Didn't have and <laughs> they didn't have Facebook, that's right. Yeah. Well, they had face to Facebook, you know? <laughs> but they actually related to each other, unlike my students. So. 
Yeah, they don't want to relate to me because I don't do Facebook. You, know. <laughs> you don't do Facebook. Okay, I think we had a question. E here. Email was bad enough. Yeah. Could, could you tell us what the source is that's furthest east on the continent and how the distribution of that material matches? No, that's or, easy. It's uh, uh, Obsidian Cliff and Yellowstone. Okay, and, and so what is the distribution of that throughout the continent versus the distribution all of the sources the way, All the way over to the east coast. They find it in Vermont. Uh, they find it in the maritime provinces, uh, all the way down into Florida. Now, I'm talking about one per one or two in Florida and three or four in Vermont. But, so yeah. the fact that there's one from here in New Jersey is not that startling. Well, but it's kind of neat it was from a southwestern source. You know, yeah. who cares about Wyoming, you know? So, <laughs> so Thank yeah. You. yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, so what, it goes back to why do you study obsidian? I mean, it has value and it has a unique value and it did prehistorically too. You could explain it because it, it naps different than chert. Uh, it gives you a much sharper uh, edge. And you probably all heard the story that. Uh, Don Crabtree, a famous flint napper, had heart surgery with obsidian. Uh, they used to, they, but they used, uh, Jeff Flanagan used to make blades for optical surgery commercially, but now they don't do that because they have laser. Uh, and the reason is it's such a sharp edge that it, it would cut between the cells rather than the cut cells. So I, and you know, prehistoric nappers knew that. I mean, they knew it experimentally. I mean, they were their first scientists. I mean, it was all experimentation. Um, so. There can't be any more questions. <laughs> Question back here. Have there been any sources of uh, mahogany obsidian found in the Southwest? Uh, yeah, and you probably won't like this answer, but almost every source that I spend enough time on, there's some mahogany. Government Mountain is a good example. But government mounts is kind of funny. The mahogany is just on the, on the cortex on the outside. Um, there's a source called Slate Mountain, or Wallace Tank, up in uh, the San Francisco field near Flagstaff. That's all red. You don't see it archaeologically because it's what we call vitrophoric. It has a lot of sanidine phenocrysts in it. And so it's not, it's not the great raw material. But you do find it every so often. There's a lot of red up there. And that, boy, that. Lapidaris and rock hounds have destroyed that source. But there's quite a bit of red up there. Um, that's the major ones. There's something in the back of my head. The one I use is the one in Warner Mountains up in northeastern California, because I can get nodules this big. And it's also what's called a needle source commercially. They make these long, um, those are per perlite needles, what they are. I mean, the perlite is all around it. And they use it for making uh, wind chimes and earrings and stuff like that, and they don't care about the nodules, so I just go up there and back up my pickup, and I say, hey, I'll get rid of all these for you, and they're just after the needles. Uh, but that's beautiful red stuff. The other famous one is Glass Buttes, Oregon, and you see that stuff all the way over to the East Coast, too. Uh, we haven't found the, uh, wall, the Warner Mountain stuff that far east, but I particularly like it. It's really great for making large bifaces. That's really all I care about is one napping. <laughs> That's one thing that I did for my dissertation is uh, somebody asked about quality. I don't know who it was here. Um, each source, I uh, attempted to produce uh, an obsidian Chiricahua point. It looked like Chiricahua, side notches. So there's a little bit of technology involved. And that's how I evaluated the quality, it was that way. So each one of those, I've got points from each one of those sources. Well, I've given a lot of them away now. but. Um, so I know, yeah, I know that Los Vidrios is crap. That's another geological <laughs> truth. It's crap. And that Government Mountain is good. And all of these sources have good stuff that's a little bit better than others. I still haven't figured out the Antelope Creek thing. Uh, you know, I use bipolar. Bipolar reduction is where you have a small or very large, but a very tiny piece. <laughs> you could go ahead and do it this way, but you're going to lose a thumb. <laughs> but you can put it on an anvil like this, and you can break it open very easily. And you do that with Antelope Creek stuff and it explodes. It has something to do with the age or the, uh, there might be a little bit of water in it or something. I'm not really sure what it is. I can't get geologists, to, the, the glass geologists to really look at this. But a source is contemporaneous, the Mule Mountain stuff doesn't do that. So, you know, so I don't know. But for pressure flaking, once you get a flake, it's great. I mean, there's some really beautiful points in some of these sites made out of that stuff. So. 
They were more successful than I was. Question over here? No. She has a question. Um, in Mesoamerica, of course, obsidian was really big. It was yeah, big deal. Yeah. A much bigger deal. It was a commodity. You could, you I could mean, it, it was o the oil of, of Mesoamerica. Oil. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, even jade. And everything. Uh, well, and jade, too, until they ran out. But um, that, I mean, what kind of cultural difference would there, there be, do you think, between a society that you know used it had much more pragmatic use, it seems. I mean, of, like here. Yeah, yeah, like here, and and something. I mean, they did use it for practical things a lot, but I mean, they weren't doing that many more practical things than than uh, in the Southwest, and it, it's you know they were crazy for it. Well, <laughs> there is there is something similar, and it's in the classic period I've seen. This will kind of answer your question. In Mesoamerica, a lot of the production, particularly in the Maya, in the lowland Maya area, a lot of the obsidian production is in the elite houses. Now, so they were either part of the elite or they were being paid well to do this stuff. They're, it's like, you're a really good napper, come on in. You know, here they just laugh at nappers, but in our society, but back then it was a big deal. So, you know, they did something with it. But uh, there's a couple of classic period sites. Uh, Marana is one. One of the sites in Tano Basin, I can't remember which it was, where they found in the, in the platform, in one of the rooms in the platform, a subfloor Oya that was completely full of Marekanites from one source. At Marana, it was all Sauceda Mountains. So there is some value in that. I mean, that's one place yeah, where we can yeah. see that. It's nothing like Mesoamerica, but uh, there is that. Um, among the, in the pre-classic again, uh, at uh, Snake Town, I noticed that they made what Chuck calls Santan barb points. Uh, they're really beautiful. They're concave based and there's really large barbs on them. Almost com always found in burials at Snake Town. They're almost exclusively made out of superior, which is a, if you've ever seen that in, in, in flakes or even a small biface or a point, it's almost transparent. And I, that's, Cal Canyon is like that too. That's another reason I think the Clovis were interested in Cal Canyon because it's transparent. You make these Clovis points and you can see right through them, like the quartz points at either Knockle or Lehner. Um, so th they, they appreciated it aesthetically as well as they did technologically. Mm -hmm. uh, nothing like Mesoamerica, but you know, this isn't Mesoamerica. Some people might disagree with that, but there were more people. There were more, yeah. But look what happened to them. You know, look what the Maya did. Yeah, they're doing the same thing we're doing now. So. No, only we're doing it on a much bigger scale. I think Homo sapiens has a bad gene. We were talking about that, and I was, I'm staying at a B and B here, and the guy, there's a guy staying there. He's going to, he's going to start working here. He's a Canadian doctor who works up in far northern Ontario with the Indian groups up there. He's, yeah, he's a great guy. So we started talking about what happened to Neanderthals. And, you know, and I said, so Homo sapiens had a bad gene. You know, manifest, destiny, manifest destiny is not just with us. It's, it goes way back. So out of Africa, manifest destiny. We're going we're gonna to kill all species around here. So. And we're going to use obsidian to do it. <laughs> That's crazy. Any other questions? Any answers? <laughs> I would want the answer. Well, Steve, thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome.